Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello and welcome to episode 36. I have an epic conversation to share with you. So epic that this conversation is going to span two podcast episodes. I came across my guest, artist and science communicator Kirsten Carlson, when she posted something on the Nature Journal Club Facebook page about an online exhibition she's currently part of. I immediately knew that I needed to interview her and I messaged her straight away. She agreed to be a guest and I'm so grateful she did. The reason why I was so captivated by her work is that she has actually taken nature journaling to the extreme and created nature journal pages under the sea ice in Antarctica. This experience is so rare and so fascinating. She's been to Antarctica twice in her life. The first time was as a marine biology undergraduate student doing undersea research. The people she met on that first expedition showed her that science and art could be brought together and helped her forge a career in science illustration and science communication. 25 years later, she was back in Antarctica for her second expedition, and this time sketching under the sea ice as a way of communicating the magic and mystery of the seventh continent to others through her art. In total, Kirsten has spent 45 hours diving under the Antarctic sea ice and hearing about her experiences just blew my mind. As I said, Kirsten is currently part of an online exhibition of Antarctic artists and writers. Her contribution to the exhibition is called Undersea Illuminations. When you visit the exhibition online, you'll see her undersea sketches digitized and animated and fascinating video footage and explanations about the process of sketching under the sea ice and her personal reflections on the meaning of it all. So let's dive into the first part of this two-part conversation. Kirsten, thank you so much for being here with me. I'm very, very keen to hear all about your amazing adventures. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. The The world of nature journaling is worldwide. And so when you yes. reached out to me, I was very excited. Good. So I'd love to know, how did all this begin? I'd love to know, have you always loved the ocean, even from an early age? Uh, I would have to say that my love of the ocean actually started as a love of water, because I grew up in the Midwest of the U.S. in Missouri, where there is no ocean except the fossil one. And um, I watched a lot of TV shows growing up that were focused on the ocean. So the miracle of television helped me see the undersea world before I actually got my toes wet. And it wasn't until I was in high school, uh, about 17 years old, that I actually put my toes in the Pacific Ocean for the first time. Oh, that much must have been a magical experience when you already loved the ocean to then be there. Yeah, so the idea of of the ocean intrigued me because I love animals and because I love sea life in particular. And so all that had already established itself before I actually got in seawater. And when I finally got to the ocean, it was more than I could ever imagine. So it was an amazing experience the first time and continues to be every time I do stick my toes in the water. Oh, wow. And then you grew up and became a marine scientist. Tell me about that. Yeah, how does that happen in Missouri? (laughs) Well, I... Um, I think it started with me being a very curious person. And so in our world, being curious kind of is synonymous with being a scientist. Mm. Although we've kind of lost touch with that label, scientist, meaning that you're curious. It's sort of become this ivory tower. And I'd (laughs) always been artistic. And I actually did not know until I was 23 years old that I could combine science and art So when I was in high school, I knew I was going to college and science was the perfect path for me. I wanted to help the world. I wanted to help humanity thrive rather than survive. 
And science seemed to me to provide a lot of those answers, especially the more I got into science, the more I understood the world around me. And I've always been focused on nature, right? I'm not, I love outer space, but I'm not really wanting to be an astronomer. Um, I love mathematics. Um, I definitely never wanted to be a medical person. I love engineering, but I never, I work on cars, but I never wanted to actually do that for a living. It's just what I love to do in my side time. So all that combined with this love of water, curiosity, creativity, um, I went to college and in the US you have to do an undergraduate degree. And then if you want to become like a marine biologist, you really have to go to graduate school. So that's mm -hmm. four, four years plus another two to four years, depending on what you want to do, two to six years. So that's where I was at with my career when I was 23 years old, that I was on my way to becoming a marine biologist. And I, I found out that you could combine science and art and I, I never looked back. Yeah. So you essentially switched the trajectory of your career to science communication after a two and a half month long expedition to Antarctica. And I'd love for you to tell me about this first expedition, how it came about and what it involved. So it was a life changing experience. I was in graduate school for marine science in California at a little California State University Marine Laboratory in Moss Landing, California. And I ended up working in the Benthic Lab. And the Benthic Lab is a group of scientists who are focused on bottom ocean ecology, typically. And there was a project in Antarctica, and I was working on developing, developing my thesis project, my thesis proposal. Mm -hmm. And those two things came together through a lot of serendipity and a lot of things that happened in the lab. And in, this is a long time ago now, 1992, <laughs> um, I headed down to start my thesis down there. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be on iceberg scours and how they bulldoze bottom communities and comparing those to an area of, of McMurdo, State, um, around McMurdo Station that was impacted by human um, pollution and look at how those communities were affected and see what the contrast was between natural disturbance and human disturbance on these mm -hmm. ecosystems that live in the sediment. So I was doing a lot of diving, a lot of do, uh, transects. I, the way I was going to quantify information was by swimming over the bottom with a video camera and recording what I saw and then counting those things that I saw on the seafloor later in in a lab. Mm -hmm. So I did about 66 dives when I was there and it was a wonderful wonderful experience and I met two artists um, that were down there as part of the National Science Foundation Antarctic Artists and Writers Program, a photographer named Galen Rowell who has passed away he died um unfortunately in a in a photography accident but he was oh, wow. a photographer and then william stout who is an amazing illustrator who was who we actually took scuba diving um and i was his dive buddy it was pretty fun mm -hmm. uh he was he's an illustrator he lives in the la area he's quite well known and he was he and i had lots of conversations about science and art so that's how it started mm -hmm. um i did not I did not know I was going to quit my thesis. I was actually <laughs> supposed to go down the next season to um, collect more data. And when I came back, I realized um, that I wasn't truly passionate in my heart and soul with just pr pursuing science. That's ultimately what it came down to. There were lots of side things like um, when you're a scientist, you either have to choose research or education. I wasn't thrilled with either. I'd always liked being a person that explained information to other people. So I liked being that in-between person. My natural abilities as a designer and illustrator meant that I was always the one my scientific referred, scientific friends referred to as the creative one. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think of it as a career. And when I got back, I found out right up the road from where I was going to graduate school, there was a program in science communication and it had two tracks, science writing and science illustration. And those people that I met through that program 
I took a summer class to get familiar with the program to see if it was something that, that would um, inspire me. And the first class I sat down and I was like, holy crap, mm-hmm. this is exactly what I've been looking for. And I was, I was attracted to the scientific illustration side. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always been a writer, but not taken it as seriously as my artistic side. So then you enrolled and never looked back, is that right? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, lots of soul searching, lots of crying sessions, like sitting. I yes. remember it was it's fairly hard traumatic. To quit something. Mm-mm. Yeah, it was fairly traumatic to tell my advisors that yeah. I was quitting. Um, but when I when I applied to the program at UC Santa Cruz um, and got in. Uh, and started those classes it was amazing it was an it was a really great experience Mm. and it sounds like you've had the chance to do lots of different types of science communication you've done children's book illustrations you've done a whole lot of a whole range of different things I'd love to hear more about that about carving out a career in different ways in different areas yeah so it's really been sort of a building block career. So um, I couldn't have gotten into scientific illustration without my background in science. So my, mm-hmm. my pursuit of an undergraduate degree in biology, and then my interest at an even younger age in animal behavior and being impacted by those programs on TV, and even at a younger age, mm-hmm. falling in love with the water And also being artistic. I mean, I was always the one wanting a new box of crayons, and I still have an art tool addiction to this day. (laughs) I I, I want all new art tools. So it's all built on one one thing after another. And one of the things that I started doing when I was in California, still pursuing my biology, my marine science degree, was I was volunteering at Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so while I was in the program at UC Santa Cruz in science communication, again, loving to be the middleman between science and the public, I I feel like I have a knack and I enjoy sharing what I find amazing in nature with people. And it gets through, like I can speak scientists, but I can also speak like giggly, childlike excitement. (laughs) Yeah. So, so what happened was, af- while I was at UC Santa Cruz, I was one of the first people to design the website for Monterey Bay Aquarium. It's when the web was new, and I knew it was big. I knew the internet was here to stay. Well, yes. I didn't know it. I didn't know how big it would get, but I knew it was that medium that would allow a place like Monterey Bay Aquarium to engage with the public. And their goal was to communicate conservation and what was happening in the scientific world to the public through an aquarium. And so the web was an extension Mm -hmm. of that. So I did that. And I also um, ended up getting a job there. So I was volunteering as a diver. I was volunteering as a docent. So I was face to face with the public. And I was working behind the scenes, helping develop um, print design things like brochures and whatnot. And I was getting on the job training from a wonderful art director there and uh, the the person who was in charge of the publications department, they gave me a great on the job education, and that kind of built on everything else that I had. Mm, so it's like the, yes. this thirty layer cake, and then, <laughs> um, you know, I was working there and I was also freelancing, working with scientists, working with educators, working with um, individuals on everything relating to nature, but different facets. So. I was working with scientists on doing scientific illustration. So what I was officially trained to do, I was doing uh, combining graphic design and illustration to create posters for educational purposes for a sanctuary called Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. I was um, just getting interested in children's books because the publications department at Monterey Bay Aquarium decided to create their first children's book. And I came this close to being the illustrator and I didn't get it, but I, but as a result, I got bit by the bug. Yes. (laughs) And um, kids books are just another way to share your excitement and enthusiasm for a subject with an audience. And in the case of picture books, a lot of times it's an audience that can't yet read. So pictures are a really important part of that. And somebody usually reads to them. And so that's a really fun medium. So all yeah. these things were were fueling my skills. And to this day, I'm still developing, you know, I'll never stop developing my skill set. So I officially became freelance full time when I fell in love with my husband, um, which is why I'm in Germany, because of his job. 
And um, I'm sure that I would still be in Monterey Bay if I hadn't fallen in love with him and become a world adventurer. So that yes. that that kind of covers the big paint strokes. That's a fabulous story. And I love also that you are illustrating books because I've heard from a number of my guests that books in conjunction with like time spent in nature were a really pivotal part of their development into someone who's passionate about nature. And so there you are doing, doing that for other people, for, for young people. And it's wonderful. So I'd love to talk about what happened next. So in uh, 2017, you had a second chance to go to Antarctica and this time you were actually drawing under the sea ice and this expedition was part of the National Science Foundation's Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. Tell me about this program and tell me about that. What what happened next? Well, okay, so this this twenty seven layer cake of of <laughs> skills that I've been building um, the whole time that I have been building that Antarctica's sort of been in the background. I do pro- mm. I, I've been doing projects revolving around Antarctica. I get really excited about Antarctica. <laughs> And I knew about the program because of those two gentlemen I met in 92. Uh, but the rules, the guidelines for applying are pretty high up there. Like I, if I was at layer 27 on my cake, you needed to be at la- layer 87. So bet- between 1992 and about 2000, I, I started thinking about it seriously around 2001, meaning applying to the program. It took me from 2001 to 2016 to actually get over the hump of being (laughs) afraid to apply and apply. Mm -hmm. And um, I am thrilled that that the National Science Foundation funded the proposal. Mm. The proposal is something I'm working on right right this very second. It's going to take probably the rest of my life to Mm -hmm. fully, um, well, the three projects are an online blog or mm-hmm. an a online journal, a ver- an, exi- an exhibition, a traveling exhibition, and one or more books. One of those books would be a children's book. Mm-hmm. And um, there's, I would like to do a book that's more an illustrated guide to sea life mm-hmm. in Antarctica, like a coffee table book is what we would call that. And so the... The program is a fantastic way for the United States government to support the scientists that are going down there and sharing it through the lens of artists who visit those scientists. That's about as concise as I can make it. The reason that's important, in my personal opinion, is because all of us really contain an artist and a scientist. It's just in this day and age, we often get lost in those those words, scientist and artist. Um, Artists are some magical group of people that can draw stuff really well and scientists can solve all the world's problems. I mean, that's kind of the the overarching idea. However, if you're curious and if you're creative, that means you are a scientist and an artist as labels. And so, um, I think it's really important that this program began um, through the eyes, through the vision of one particular fellow named Guy Guthridge, and that it continues. Right now, it's on hold. Um, it's being reviewed, unfortunately. So I think it's really important that it continues because we want the seventh continent to be accessible. Now, not everybody is going to be able to jump on a plane and go down there, but because I was able to, and I'm passionate about sharing the undersea world with people. I'm a wonderful spokesperson to share that undersea world in Antarctica with other people to make them maybe glimpse their world a little bit differently that surrounds them because they're seeing Antarctica through my eyes. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And there's something completely magical about Antarctica and it's beautiful to to give someone a glimpse, as you say, not everyone's going to have a chance to go there, of course not, but to, I, I, it, it's bringing up memories for me of a project I did when I was 13 years old. It was my first year of high school and we did a project on Antarctica. And I just remember this feeling like really visceral feeling of like complete wonderment and 
awe and the, the magic of it. And, and that was just through doing a research project when I was a teenager. And yeah, I think communicating that through, through art and photography in whatever way is going to bring people closer to that magic. So um, I'm just curious, I know this is probably off topic, but definitely worth it to just go down this rabbit hole a little bit. Tell, yeah. tell, tell me, tell us a little bit about your project. Do you know, to be honest, I can't even remember. I just remember um, drawing. Um, it was a really long time ago, but I just remember it was about Antarctica and I just remember drawing like glaciers and um, hmm. that's all. I, I don't remember the subject of it. I just remember the awe, the feeling. That's what I remember, just the feeling of researching Antarctica and just being like captivated by the magic of it. I don't remember the the research topic. I just remember the magic. Okay, that's um, totally valid. That's really cool that 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 stayed with you because where scientists are focused on the research, right, which is a really important thing to be doing down there um, for various reasons. It was, in your case, the emotional connection, that that mystical or even if you can't remember specifically what it is you researched, that emotion stuck with you. So that's where that's where my job as a science communicator comes in because I try to capture, I try to blend that love of facts and exploration with the emotional um, passion and love and joy and like just the awe of it all. And it's, it's a, it's something that science doesn't do, but artists embrace. And so being between the two and joining them together is like this perfect realm of being a nerd, but being kind of an emotional nerd. (laughs) (laughs) An emotional nerd. I love that so much. (laughs) Yeah. That fusion of art and science, it's really a powerful point. It's really a powerful way of communicating this magic. And in fact, I was watching a video I've been going into your work more and more since since learning about you and I was watching a video re- you recorded under the sea ice in Antarctica and I felt a whole lot of emotions and I'm generally a very emotional person it doesn't take much to make me cry but I was <laughs> I was feeling like really deeply moved seeing this unique world this shockingly different world that almost nobody gets to experience and it stuck with me that this world continues without humans. You know, we think we're so important and that we, the world revolves around us, but under the ice, this whole life, this whole daily dance of like organisms interacting and living and dying and surviving or succumbing to predation, it's going on and you had this precious chance to witness it and it was, it was really humbling and moving just to even see the video you took of your moments under the sea ice. Mm, Tell me about that, the emotion. Yeah, well, um, it's wonderful to hear you express what you felt uh, watching my mm. video. Way, way, way better, way gratifying to hear you share all that. <laughs> so um, ask me the question again so I can re- refocus. Tell me about the emotion of it. You know, being under the ice and seeing this world that's, that's just so rare to see and yet it's going on all by itself. It doesn't need us. I'd love to know what you felt when you were there. Well, what you're describing is it's sort of not just true for me in Antarctica. That's very, you've described something that happens for me every time I actually take a field sketchbook in hand or slow down and draw what I see or you know, meditate, but actually Mm -hmm. drawing in a journal is what I call active meditation for myself. And that feeling of being interrelated to a thing bigger than just myself happens every single time with those, Mm -hmm. with, with those moments. And Antarctica happened to be the place I got to go to focus on something I've been wanting to do since I was a 24 year old down there in 1992. Mm -hmm. Um, and it it is to convey that we are part of a bigger ecosystem. Um, I, I, I tend to believe that humans do a little more, I am the center of the universe thinking than we need to. Yes. <laughs> um, I, 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 
it's not good or bad. It's just what humans do, right? And so yeah. what is so important for me about diving in Antarctica and diving anywhere underwater and specifically sketching it is that I slow down, I become curious in the moment, I see things that I would never see if I were busy just taking photographs. And honestly, yes. the mix of photography and field sketching is great because when I when I am in photographer mode, I'm trying to get the right light, I'm trying to get it in focus. It's a completely different mindset than when I'm just sitting there with my sketch pad, watching what happens or what unfolds. And this idea that everything is interrelated comes to me on the page when I see that, like it's live, happening in front of me and it's I'm never filled with sadness although I might pout a little bit when I see some animal eating another animal but that is such a part of our life that is we as humans make that such a big deal often you know for the prey it's a bad thing for the predator it's a good thing but regardless of if you're predator or prey they're interrelated you cannot have yes. one without the other yeah, it's interesting, predator prey. You know, yeah, when I think about that too, I'm always like, you want everyone to live in harmony and you don't want anyone to be eaten. And <laughs> it's a very emotional thing. But in fact, predation, keeping a population in check through predation is really important for the prey population as well. You know, if there's no predator, if there's no top predator in an ecosystem, then the prey's um, numbers explode and then their food sources exploited and that's not good for them. Then the, then the population dies of starvation. Anyway, it's a tangent, but yeah, it's, um, it's easy for me atta to attach emotions to them. But these things are natural and important, even for the prey population. Yeah, and I, I will add on to that, that... Um, let me let me just give you a specific specific example that I ended up not featuring in that underwater video that you saw as part of the exhibition, but it will show up at some point on my Fathom Antarctica website. So again, I feel like a visit, visitor. You know, I I try to pretend that I'm a fish when I'm underwater, yeah, or a seal. But in in fact, I am a visitor, and I do you know leave and come back, and it's like you know, is that same fish in the same spot it was before in Antarctica? More often than not, it is very close to the same spot. It's kind of interesting. They don't move around a lot. Okay. So one time during a dive, I was watching a fish. It's the genus is called Trematomus. It's a kind of rock cod, but I know it by its scientific name, Trematomus. And I'm watching it and a little tinafore, which is a, a gelatinous creature, that lives in the water column came we'll say swimming by it's basically you know just kind of going by the the fish which i was watching and trying to sketch came up and grabbed the dang oh, gosh um i actually was videoing i wasn't sketching it it was with my video yeah and it, it grabbed the tina four and started eating it it was a it was a comb jelly i think yeah. okay so we'll just call it a gelatinous creature because I can't remember right now in yeah. the conversation, but I have video <laughs> and it was just so, um, I hate to say magical, but it was magical yeah. that I witnessed yes, uh, a, a moment, moment mm. um, where that would have happened any, anyway, regardless of if I was there or not. But it was, it was really amazing to watch and um, I'm going to make an anecdotal comparison. So there's this park in the U.S. called Yosemite National Park. You may have heard of it. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a pretty important monument there, the Half Dome. It's a, I mean, it's a natural landmark. And so there is a place that you can park your car, get out, look at Half Dome. And in that situation, I happen to have my sketchbook with me. I still have the sketchbook in the other room in my collection <laughs> of sketchbooks. And I sat down to sketch Half Dome. So... These moments in time when you sketch really are timeless. I mean, they really, I am really being earnest when I say that they are like capturing little moments of time and freezing them in time and space. And you can bring yourself back to that moment later, which is really different than if you're just snapping a photo and moving on, yeah. right? So you're, you're witnessing, you're engaging with all your senses as much as you can. And so 
this half dome experience I had, I sat there for maybe 10 minutes sketching half dome. And I remember the little figure eight shaped snow patch at the top. So you could see the top of half dome. And the other very acute awareness I had was how many people were passing by me while I was drawing that little figure eight patch of snow just snapping pictures and going, mm. hey, look at that ground squirrel. And Not that it's bad or anything, but I feel like I had a, a relationship with Half Dome that will never go away and it, and it impacted me. What does it may, mean for the greater good of humanity? I'm, I can't answer that. But I understand that little moment in time so much better, which is what we are. We are nothing but collections of moments moments in time as we you know get older and with ex experience yes. and that's what books are that's what these podcasts are they're sharing our wisdom with other people so that they can learn and grow from those experiences so it's a yeah. little bit of a sideways anecdote but I think it's appropriate because that happens all the time over and over when I'm above or below water sketching specifically yes. not so much when I'm in my studio on deadline for project that's more <laughs> of a a right brain or a left brain thing <laughs> but but being underwater in Antarctica sketching it was really important to me to do that because when I started doing that in Fiji in 2006 I realized that it engaged just like above water it engaged all my senses it slowed me down it made me both curious and more conscious of what I was seeing it made me an explorer. It made me see things that I would never see had I just taken a camera with. And so all those things were really important because I knew that I was only going to be in Antarctica for a limited amount of time. Yes. And I, I definitely want to go back. I would love to be the spokesperson for the sea life in Antarctica, like mm -hmm. the artistic spokesperson, if you will. And I would love to convey the stories. I am conveying the stories of the scientists and the sea life through my work to others through, through that one little experience, yeah. well, both experiences. And yeah, so it's, it's oh, so cool. I just, I do want to go back. <laughs> That's the one bad thing. When you go to Antarctica, you want to go back usually. Yeah. I can imagine it must be just this magical time that you, yeah, I can imagine it would be something you'd want to do again and again but I'd love to go into all the details of the actual experience like the physical experience of being there under the sea ice and I I wonder if you'd be okay if I just asked you a whole bunch of questions <laughs> about what it was like so firstly I'm thinking about like how did you actually physically get under the under the ice did they have did they make a hole especially for you to go in what was the situation like for actually so, accessing yeah so diving at on the ross sea in McMur at mcmurdo station in antarctica has a certain protocol that goes with it so they have a machine that drills a hole the hole is okay. four four feet in diameter so about a meter and some change a meter and a quarter let's say enough for a human body the ice thickness, so it's annual sea ice that they're drilling through. So that annual sea ice can vary in thickness, but it, it it's usually around six to seven feet thick. So let's say two meters thick approximately. And once they've done that, they pull a portable building on skids over the hole. Mm. And that becomes your dive hut. Okay. And in the dive hut, there's a hole on the ground, a hole in the floor. And you, you pop that, you pop the cover off. And so it's directly over the dive hole. Oh, so, wow. yeah. So you're in the hut getting dressed. You, you go in the hole and then you, when you're done, you come back up and you can get undressed in the warm hut. So it's actually as Rob, Rob Robbins, who is one of the head divers down there says, it's some of the easiest diving on the planet because it's not like you have to flip off a boat. You don't yeah. have to trudge. You don't have to trudge through a seashore. You're like sitting there putting your fins on and the holes right there. <sighs> and, and the visibility is super clear. So that that's the, that's the answer to your question. So yeah. that's, so those are two key components. We have the machine that dr drills a hole. Um, there, there are situations where they dynamite the hole, but that doesn't oh, really wow. happen much. They don't, they don't do that anymore. It was more common back in 1992. Okay. Um, but 
I'm actually not sure where the machine can't get. I, I don't have that knowledge on the tip of my uh, brain. What happens when they don't have the machine available to them? But I have footage. I have the whole creation of a dive hole that oh, ended up being fun. an obser observation tube. So people that can't go scuba diving could actually go down into a tube. So they drilled oh, the hole. Fantastic. Yeah, they drilled the hole and you can see the tube going in. So, uh, yeah, that's one of my posts, I think, on my journal, my Fathom Antarctica journal. Oh, okay. fun. I'll link that in the show notes because that sounds amazing. Okay, next question. Yes. <laughs> so you go down, you have a buddy, I'm guessing, because you always have to have a buddy with scuba diving. Yes. And is your yes. buddy just checking up on you or are they doing their own sort of job and research down there? So um, the way that – it worked is we would always have a dive buddy um, that dive buddy would stay in the vicinity so within a few kick lengths mm -hmm. but you definitely don't need that like hover or hold hands yeah. because it's so clear okay um but you do need to be able to get to your buddy pretty quick okay um so the the situation in my for my particular project down there in 2017 was that I had a collaborator and we always had the dive officers down there. They're the dive team that's in charge of doing all the work down there. Like they have to repair pipes and they have to do oh, all yeah, the, okay. they were our dive buddies. So one would always be paired with my former collaborator and one would be paired with me. And they really are the reason that this project was successful. I mean, their support was vital to me. They helped me create that drawing platform. It was through their ingenuity that we evolved it into something that would work in Antarctica because, of course, I'd only used it in the tropics. And they were more often than not with their cameras taking photographs of me or photographs of animals, which are now things that I can use as reference material. I mean, yes. all the photographs you see of me are by one of those – one of three people – yeah, Brenda Konar, who is one of the dive officers down there, Rob Robbins, or Steve Rupp. And those guys are amazing. I cannot, I owe them, <laughs> I owe them everything. So they're fantastic. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And let's talk about the physical um, board that you were holding. So you have a slate and a pen attached to a, a stretchy cord. Tell mm -hmm. me about the physical things that you used. Well, the, the paper that I used was um, tree-free plastic paper. Um, you're going to hear some background noise really quick as I grab it. <laughs> oh, here it is. Okay, you're going to hear some noise. Hang on. <laughs> this is the drawing slate that I used in Antarctica. Oh, it's big. Uh-huh. Wow. So this is the largest, so the, the size of the drawing slate I used in Antarctica in American English measurements is 11. It would take an 11 inch by 14 inch piece of paper. Okay. That paper is plastic paper. It's called Yupo paper is the brand and the company that makes <laughs> it is Legion paper. It's a paper that's promoted for artists to use with like alcohol inks or other mediums. Oh, yeah. it's, it's all slick. It works really well underwater because, of course, it doesn't get saturated. <laughs> and then um, the much of this stuff is what I learned as a graduate student in marine biology being a scientific diver. So okay. the slate that I started using, which is something that um, I actually have from my graduate school days, is this size. Okay, smaller. So let's, let's a again. A third of the so size. Mm -hmm. It's about a third of the size. And the other important piece is that we would use surgical tubing in graduate school along with zip ties to hold everything to the slate. So it's stretchy, it's compressible, um, it's cheap, and it's, uh, it's, I still use it to this day. Yeah. The pencil, so there's two kinds of pencils I've used. Um, I do use pencil. I did try and experiment and use some other mediums. I tried using a space pen. I tried using, um, I don't like ballpoints to begin with, and it doesn't improve for me underwater. So I quit that pretty quick. <laughs> and then um, I use mechanical pencils. So mechanical pencils have metal parts, which is a problem with salt water. Mm -hmm. So the mechanical pencils all, always had, had a limited life. 
and they would always break at the most inconvenient times. <laughs> so this is a pencil that's designed for underwater slates. It's designed for divers. Okay. It's kind of a, it's a big circumference. It's bigger than a normal pencil. And inside you use a woodless pencil in graphite mm -hmm. and you sharpen it and uh, you put it in this plastic holder. So you can see that the lead, there's no wood surrounding it. So the wood is yes. another problem. If you try to use a pencil with that yes. has a wood, wood case, the wood gets saturated and it's just not yes, a good thing. Course. The lead breaks really easy. So, so these are the magic tools, plastic paper. Yeah. And this is actually, these are my underwater drawings. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. So this is how I, this is where I'm storing them. They are absolute treasures. Like you yeah. must be so attached to them. Are they one of the things you would grab in a house fire? <laughs> oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're, they are priceless. I mean, yeah, they really are priceless. And um, you can really draw underwater with any kind of slate. Um, some, I mean, the slate is a device used for communicating with your dive buddy, right? Usually you write yes, notes on okay. it, or if you're recording fish, if you're a scientist, you might be trying to record the number of fish you see. So you can buy something like this. What is this? This is a dive, this is a drawing slate that you would buy at a dive shop. Oh, okay. Yep. So the one that I took to Antarctica with me, my husband custom engineered for me. Um, the whole thing with drawing underwater is I kind of have phases. So I wanted to go as simple as possible. There are people who are oil painting underwater. Oh, wow. um, I tried use I tried using colored pencils, but I ran into a problem really quickly where the lead got soft, um, mm. pieces would come off, and I really didn't want that getting into the environment. So the reason I just use these basic tools, plastic paper and a pencil and a video camera and slash camera camera is because I just don't want to impact the environment. I, yes. I don't want to lose the paper. Um, I don't want to lose the pencil. I don't want to lose the rubber tubing. The whole idea is to try to be self-contained. So what happens after I come up from the dive in Fiji? So when I first started doing this, I was basically adapting what I'd learned as a scientific diver to this artistic practice of field sketching that I'd been doing above water since I was little. Mm. Um, I would come back up with the pencil sketches and have notes. And then I would try to do a color study. So that's where I would break out my watercolors, the field guides, decipher my notes and do a color study of whatever I saw. And what was fantastic about that is the first time I did this, I had no camera. I completely relied on my memory. Oh, wow. And as long as I came back up from the dive and did the drawing and the study immediately before the next dive, it was no problem. It's still no problem to do that. If you don't have the time to do that, that's when it becomes problematic. So my drawings never are fantastic. There's only been a handful of them that really have turned out wonderfully. Um, but it's the memory that freezed frozen moment in time and space that's yes. so important. Being able to remember details like going back to that half dome um, figure eight shape of snow patch on the roof, on the top. That yeah. stuff is so important. And that's ultimately those undersea illuminations that I created specifically for this exhibition that's online right now. Those were me adapting something that wasn't quite working the same as it did in Fiji to this new realm. Um, mm. When I was in Antarctica, it was all about diving. It was all about drawing underwater and then basically had time to sleep and eat and get ready for the next dive or talk to scientists. There wasn't a lot of time to sit down and do the color studies. I tried, but I, I got a backlog really quickly. Mm. So that's why I relied so much more on Steve, Brenda, and um, Rob's images and my own images because they, they helped me now that I'm back and not in Antarctica. I can go back and relive those moments through my sketches. And this undersea illumination project really was my proof of 
project that I could do that. It was it's yes. been fantastic. So there's a there's a slight difference between tropical and polar underwater mm. field sketching. <laughs> but part of it was I had to adapt to the way things were being laid out in Antarctica. I mean, you're always at the will of the weather. Um, mm. You have other people you're trying to coordinate with. I mean, there's a myriad number of things that impact your ability to spend time being an artist above water. So I was definitely being artistic as much as I could underwater. And the thing that I want to do when I go back is I would like to develop a process that I, like I had in Fiji, where I would do the dive, come back up and then do color study and then go back and dive come up and do another color study. And it's really laborious from the perspective that I'm not shooting hours of footage. I'm not coming back with, I saw 57 animals, but I'm getting to know the site. I'm getting to know mm. the animals. I'm getting to know the ecosystem. I'm getting to know all these things I brought back with me on this first trip are just the tip of the iceberg. And so it's been fantastic to be able to um, with these undersea illuminations to be able to use technology like procreate. And yes, to, I was going to ask yeah. you. So when you do a, um, when you do a, when you say color study, does that involve like tracing your drawing onto a new page or what does, how does that work? Specifically my underwater field sketching technique that I developed is, um, recreating. So looking at the sketch, recreating it on watercolor paper, mm -hmm. adding the color that I made color notes of and any other details that I remember mm -hmm. from the combination of the sketch and my memory of the dive. Um, in Antarctica specifically, how that evolved was we ended up having a situation where I would have a drawing like this. At this point in our video call, Kirsten is showing me some of the sketches from her Antarctic adventures. You can't see them, obviously, but if you follow the links in the show notes, you can find them all on her Fathom Antarctica website. This is a Trematomus. This is the um, this is the fish that I told you the story about. I mean, it's not the fish that ate the tinapore, yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's a Trematomus, and. Even though that's a really, that I would call that a really rough sketch, what I remember is that was perched on a rock, and these guys don't mm. move. They, it's mm. like doing a plant, like drawing a plant. They're awesome. <laughs> they don't move. And um, this was a sea star. Even though it doesn't have the accuracy of the sea star I saw, it does mm -hmm. have, there was something about the placement of the arms that interested me. Yeah. Um this is a jellyfish that was actually captured on the seafloor by an anemone already. So the jellies float by and sometimes an animal can grab them and they become, oh, wow. they go from predator to prey. <laughs> and so um, I have footage of all of these animals because at this stage, this is November 25th. So this is right before I left. Um, I had a camera attached to my drawing slate, so the camera was recording what I was drawing. So that would that ended up being my best formula for Antarctica because it allowed the adaption to the this particular extreme environment. Right, you, you're no matter what you're limited uh, on your dive by air. Um, yes. col coldness did limit a few of my dives, but believe it or not, when you have the right equipment, the coldness doesn't, it, it is a secondary thing. I mean, my hands would get cold. You, I was going to say, you're actually wearing like these giant gloves that must've made sketching difficult. Yes, it did. Um, and I, I did make up, I did say that, um, I felt like my drawings were really primitive in Antarctica. But honestly, if I go back and look at my drawings in the tropics where I was not wearing gloves, some of them look pretty darn primitive. And it, <laughs> it can it can be due to a number of things. Now, granted, I was drawing a lot smaller in the tropics mm -hmm. on that much smaller drawing slate. Mm -hmm. Being able to draw this big was great on 11 yeah. by 14. That was key. So the the less dexterous you are, the bigger you draw, the better it gets. So... <laughs> 
Um, I never did an experiment where I tried to fill the frame. That would be that would be visit number two, where I would try to draw yes. one animal as big as the slate. That would be really fun, yes. and just go back dive after dive until it was looking really good. And that was one thing I wanted to do, but again, time ran out. Other yeah. limitations were in play, so I had this wish list of things to do. Oh yeah, Kirsten, yes. you're gonna have to go back a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing with the gloves is you, I was wearing three pairs of gloves, the outer rubber glove that kept my hand dry and then sort of a thick insulated glove, which is part of the dry suit diving gear. And then a liner, which is, was my own liner, um, which was polypropylene, just a, you know, a expedition sort of weight layer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you had to get used to, to, and I, I kind of, talked about this a little bit in the video that's on the online exhibition, but you have to remember that in a dry suit, it's the air circulating through your body that's keeping you warm, right? So you mm. need a layer of air. And when you are looking down, drawing with your hand on a slate, all the air goes to the highest part of your body, which is not your hand. <laughs> so what would happen is I developed a system where I'd do this for a few seconds. So I'd wiggle my fingers and let the air rise from my main body into the fingers. And then I would draw. And then oh, wow. I would, so, and then um, early on in the system, I would photograph first, or I would draw first until my hands got cold. And then I would photograph because <laughs> with a camera, you can kind of keep your hands up higher. Mm -hmm. And drawing, it, when you're drawing stuff on the seafloor, it's kind of like you've got to be head down. So that was a good experiment. I really want heated gloves. They do exist. Um, there are some problems with heated gloves. I would love to figure out a system where I could have them be super thin and heated and I could have my dexterity. So yeah. we'll see. That, that would, that's one of those wish list things. This conversation was flowing so easily that there was no real break, no natural point that made sense to snip the conversation in half. So I've just cut it here because it's the halfway point and next week we'll have part two and dive straight back into all the action. Kirsten's going to go into more detail about the physical realities of diving under the ice, what she saw, what she experienced and so much more. So stay tuned for next week and we'll continue this conversation. In the meantime, take the time to explore Kirsten's website and the online exhibition she's currently part of. It's called Adequate Earth, Artists and Writers in Antarctica. You can find the link in the show notes for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. <laughs>